Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head of Aaron, running down his beard onto the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let us pray. Lord God, indeed it is so sweet to gather together under the name of Jesus to worship you today. We thank you for the gospel and that in Christ our Savior we have true and eternal unity with each other and with you. Bless us this hour with the Holy Spirit that we may give you the glory, do your name as we sing, receive Holy Communion, and hear your powerful word preached. We ask and pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our great high priest who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. A few announcements today. We have our water well project going on right now, um, which if you haven't been here before, haven't heard about that, we partner with a group called Christian Relief Fund, and they drill wells in Kenya um, for villages that don't have fresh water. It takes about $10,000 to, to do a well. I think our church has done 10 wells at this point, but right now we're in an interesting season until about October 15th. Um, we're asking if you would be willing to partner with that ministry. We have a matching donor, um, not just, well, one with the church, and then Justin Boot Company, they match as well. And so, for instance, if you were to give $10, um, that would turn into $20, and that $20 would be matched with another 20, so that would turn into $40, if that makes sense. And so we're looking to drill more wells. We could drill up to, I think, 20 wells or so um, if we were to do this. So if you're interested in that, we just, we ask you, uh, I think there's some more information in your bulletin um, or go by the church office. We'll be more than happy to give you more information. But regardless, whenever one of those wells gets drilled, uh, the gospel is also planted in that spot. A church is also uh, planted in that spot. So not only is it drawing for water, uh, for people to get life that way, they receive life through the preaching of the gospel through local missionaries in that area. Also, um, we want to remind everyone, obviously school is starting this week. We, I think we have a few kiddos here in the crowd. Uh, we're going to do, be doing a blessing over our teachers, our students, administration. Um, if you're, if for you kiddos, we'll have some backpack tags for you on the way out, and so you can grab one of those, but we'll do a general blessing today, uh, what we usually call our blessing of the backpacks. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to have the privilege and opportunity to gather together today to worship you, to hallow your name. God, point our focus and our vision on you. May we be relieved of any distractions, any footholds Satan is attempting to have upon us, God. May those be relieved. And instead, God, may we have such a fierce 
fierce focus on you today. God, as we look forward towards what you are already doing in, in Kenya through, through Christian Relief Fund, God, we, just, we thank you that we've been privileged to, to partner with you in this way. We thank you for the water that's being given there. We thank you for your gospel that is so boldly being preached, and we pray that many more would come to you, many more would come to Christ as a result. Father, we also pray as we enter into this new school year, we know that there's some tension, some anxiety, some unknowns, but God, you are totally in control. You know what's around every corner, and you've already planned for it. So God, we pray that you would instill a sense of trust and confidence in you. We also pray, Father, that you would protect, and you would allow safety to be had, that you would protect our, our kiddos, our teachers, administrators. And God, we pray for wisdom as well. We pray that wise decisions are made. Wise decisions made on behalf of the the teachers and the students. God, we also pray that you would bless each student, each person with peace. The, the peace that only you can provide, the peace that surpasses all understanding, Father. I pray for, for our students in particular, that they would be lights among their peers, that they would stand out, that the peace you give them would be so great that their peers would have no other choice but to ask, what is it about them that's so peaceful? And may they have an opportunity to share about who you are. God, we're thankful, we're grateful for the opportunities you give us. And today we are just especially thankful that we get to lift our voices and our hearts to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. as our hymn of communion. We are reminded that whenever we come together and we gather around this table, that this is the best sermon that we will hear. No offense, Paul. <laughs> that we know that Jesus, whenever he, he instituted these words, it was for purpose and with perfection. It was with goodness. And it was in a way that would instill confidence and courage and mobility for the believer. We know that on that last night when Jesus was gathered with his followers, he took a loaf of bread. He thanked the Father for it. He blessed it, and he broke it. And then he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which has been given for you. As often as you eat of this bread, do so and remember me. And in a similar fashion, he took a cup. 
He blessed it and he said, this cup is a new covenant between us and our Father and it is poured out in my blood. Every time that you come and you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, in these crazy, crazy times, it is indeed so sweet and we are so grateful that we have been able to continue to gather to worship you. And we are especially grateful in these times of uncertainty that we have been able to receive Holy Communion each week. As we are surrounded by all of the uncertainty and complexity of life right now, as we take this bread and as we drink the cup together, remind us, instill in our hearts that which is absolutely certain, that you love us so much that you gave Jesus to give his life, his life's blood and his body, that we might be forgiven of our sins and enjoy eternal life with you. It is so simple, Lord, when we only believe that, and it takes away so many of the complexities that we're dealing with. And so as we take of this communion today, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may be renewed with purpose and with joy and with hope, whatever else is going on, and that we may give you glory and draw others to Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us now as we recite the words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Please, please rise for the doxology.
We are grateful for the things in which you give us, but particularly these elements. God, we know that you bless us far beyond what we can ask for or even imagine. Father, today as we listen to the word, Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are softened towards your gospel. And may that provide the mobility we need to go and make disciples of all nations. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 15, beginning with verse 10. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his word. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand, what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth That is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them behind. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what makes a man unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we ask now for the Holy Spirit's power and clarity to help us understand and grasp this word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about clean and unclean. And biblically, clean and unclean doesn't mean what you and I think of clean and unclean. In fact, there could have been better uh, sermons to preach during COVID than don't wash your hands, don't worry about it, it's fine. In the Bible, when people are talking about clean or unclean, They're not talking about hygiene and sanitation. They're not worried about your health. Clean or unclean in the Bible is what we would call today, are you a good or bad person? They call it ceremonially clean. Not physically clean, though do that too. But what the the Pharisees and the scribes would say, a person can be physically clean, but they can still be unclean. As we would say, a person can be physically clean, but they can still be a bad person. So there are so many things written and understood over time about what can make somebody a good person. And Jesus, in the beginning of this chapter, starts off, his his disciples get in trouble for not washing their hands before they eat. And they ask, the Pharisees ask, uh, you know, why do they break the tradition of the elders? And Jesus says, well, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Jesus makes the point in Mark chapter 7 over and over again that the traditions of man and the word of God have become at war with one another to determine what does it mean to be a good person. Traditions of man back then were changed and manipulated over time to make the Bible more accessible and applicable. Everyone wants to come to church and hear a sermon on how to fix your life. But nobody wants to hear a sermon on repent and be baptized. So the people were in exile years ago in Babylon, and these rabbis rose up and began to take the law of Moses and teach the people of God, the Hebrews, on how to still be God's people, not necessarily by preaching what was written, but by giving them new rules to follow. A lot of times that's what people think of church. 
rules. Uh, what do we think about those people? Uh, morals and ethics. When we think of church, we think I go to church because I want to be a good person. Well, it's more complicated than that. The traditions of men can tell you in modern time what man says it takes to be a good person, but in order to focus on that, many people turn their back on what this says. Today, Jesus is forcing the issue that we would look at what it means to be good, what it means to be clean. So traditions of men today, modern uh, teaching on what it means to be a good person would be, have you, uh, have you adequately taken a stand on every issue under the sun? Do people know where you stand politically? One of my goals is that you'll never know how I vote. And the same day I was called by one person, no joke, too conservative, and got an email, lovingly, they weren't mean, but lovingly they said, we all know you're a liberal. I haven't been called a liberal in 10 years. It's, it's funny, you know, uh, how important it has become for us to figure out what's right, what's wrong, and express it to everyone so that they know that I'm a good person. So have you picked sides on every political issue under the sun? And have you adequately expressed yourself today? If not today, then this week. Have you taken to Facebook and make sure everyone knows that you're a good person? Have you, uh, have you distanced yourself from those people that some other group determines are dangerous? You shouldn't tolerate that. Have you, have you made sure you've distanced yourself from that? I'm not like them. I love when people say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not that kind of Christian. I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. Have you, uh, have you uh, determined that you're a good person over time, and have you done enough work day in and day out uh, to, to enough deeds, enough actions, enough thoughts to continue to keep yourself a good person? Traditions of men are alive today just as much as they were in the days of Jesus. And if you follow the traditions of men, what they'll say, the conclusion of all that hard work is you will be praised by men and you will be blessed by God if you're a good person. Let's see what the Bible says. I can quote all sorts of things in Scripture from Romans 3.23. From Psalm 51, but the Bible is clear up front that no one is good. No one's clean. According to the biblical standard that no one is, and because no one's clean, we, we change the standard because certainly someone must be clean. We're just reading it wrong. So we contort the words and make them say what we want them to hear, but Jesus makes it clear that it's not what you do it's not what you put into your mouth. It's not your lifestyle. It's not what you post on Facebook or where you stand on political issues or how far you've distanced yourself from people that are told dangerous. It's not how many good deeds you've done. That's not what makes you clean. But rather what comes out of you, what's in your heart, is what shows that a man is unclean. No one's clean. And, and Jesus uses this word defile. It may be what yours says Defile in Greek is koinos, which means common. Um, when you, in seminary, they teach you Greek, and they teach you koine Greek, which is common Greek, street Greek. It's the difference between studying Spain Spanish or our kind of Spanish. Common, which you hear on the streets, what people actually use. Jesus says, all the stuff that comes out of you reveals that you're common. And the opposite of common is holy. Unclean, bad, not acceptable. What Jesus is saying is your nature is showing. Every thought, every deed comes out in some form and will reveal the fact that by nature, without God's intervening grace, by nature, you and I are not clean. We're not good. That's the shared heart condition of everyone. That's the same heart that's in an American citizen is in the same as an Iranian citizen. 
The same heart that's in a Texan is the same as in a Portlandian. And boy, we don't like to think that. We like to bank our categories and we're better, we're less, this person's greater, less, I don't know. But the truth is, the same things in your heart, unintervened by God's grace, are proving your, nat- your nature and my nature is not holy, but just common, unclean. So what's in our hearts without God's grace? Self-worship? Um, obsession with our opinion? I love how uh, e- even we'll do this with God's things. People will come to church on Sunday morning and be, have a strong opinion about the music. Um, one time Francis Chan was leaving uh, mega church he, he pastored in California. He was leaving. He got a, met somebody in the parking lot, and they said to him, Pastor, I really didn't like worship today. He said, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. But we can't, we, that, our nature, that's, I'm not beating anybody up. That's our nature. We have opinions. We, we have matters of taste. And if our matters of taste aren't being met, or if my future is not secure, if, if my family's not taken care of, if I'm not being honored, If I don't get what I want, or if I lose something I think I deserve, oh, look out, world. Your nature's showing. But we don't naturally feel that way about God. Naturally, without God's intervention. We don't care whether or not God's revered or honored. We don't care whether or not people come to Christ. We don't care about righteousness. We don't don't care because that's not natural to us. Jesus says it's not what you put in, it's what's revealed by your nature that proves that you're unclean. You're not good. And no amount of actions, no amount of Facebook posts, no amount of faking it with your pictures and smiling will change your heart, will change your nature. Works cannot do it. You cannot fake being clean. You cannot fake being good. God sees. But in walks Jesus Christ. The only good man. By nature, truly good. No sin. Completely holy. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Showing off the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Jesus, our Savior, by nature, is expressing this heart. Things that are utterly foreign to me are normal for Him. In walks Jesus Christ. Now the world says if you're a good person, according to their standard, not God's, but their standard, then men will praise you and God will bless you. But finally we have a good person and men rejected him and God handed him a cross. Each of us has a choice. You can either be liked by mankind or you can be good in Christ. You can be accepted by man or you can be clean by the Savior. The very things the world says make a person good is the same, same exact standard they used to crucify the good man. Who hated him the most? The good people. Jesus Christ. Can you see your own heart? Can you see his heart? By nature. Whatever the heart wants, the mouth produces. Jesus says right here, it's not what you put in. That's why Jesus is saying, so what if my disciples don't wash their hands? So what if they heal on the Sabbath? So what if they pick heads of grain? You're using your laws and your traditions to tell me I'm bad, and I know my heart. I, says Jesus, am the only good man who's ever walked this earth, and you treat me as a criminal. Turns out, you're the blind men leading blind men to their graves. What's in the heart will display itself eventually, and what were the kinds of things Jesus did? He ate with sinners. 
He forgave sin. He healed on the Sabbath. He submitted himself with joy to the will of God, which included a cross. He was raised on the third day. He has ascended and has the right hand of God and lives and intercedes for us today. That's what he did by nature. What do I do by nature? I only eat with people I like. I only forgive when it's convenient, which means never. By nature, by nature, I don't submit myself to God's will, but I submit his will to mine. By nature, I have an ambition and I pretend God is my genie in a lamp who will help me accomplish all of my carnal hopes and dreams. By nature. By nature. Now Jesus makes the point that all the good works, verse 17, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and out the body? Like something through a goose. All your good works, all your consumption, all the stuff you try, all your religion, all your Facebook posts, apart from Christ, I mean, I I didn't write this, you understand. It's quoting him. Red letters, Jesus Christ, okay with that kind of talk. What that means is that just following Jesus Christ is not enough. Jesus is the truly good man. You and I are not good. I hope I've made that case. We're not good. We're not clean. Jesus alone is good. Jesus alone is clean. And what we cannot do is just try to follow him and do what the kinds of things Jesus does without our nature changing. We're just goats pretending to be sheep. We're just unclean people doing exterior things and our nature has not changed. I'm not good. Only God is good. And God saves sinners like me. He comes to us in Christ and embraces us in the very arms of the good man, Christ Jesus. Nearness to God is my only good. Psalm 16, I have no good apart from Thee. God embraces unclean sinners like us by the cleansing power of His Son, Jesus Christ. He embraces bad guys like me. I might not be as bad as Hitler, but I ain't as good as Jesus. And He includes me. He takes this old heart and He pushes it over and He puts a new one right next to it that's warring with the old one. He fills me with the Holy Spirit. So now I've got two natures One's going to win and one's going to lose. And every day my behavior begins to adjust, to reflect the heart He gave me. He takes all of my deeds and selfish ambitions, my natural self, before I knew Christ, He takes them all and He throws them and nails them upon the body of my Savior. And He takes all of Jesus' selfless ambition and holy nature and holy deeds and drapes them over me as if I did them. He listens to me when I pray. He treats me with the same love that he has for his son. And the world will treat me like they treated Jesus. That's okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, St. Paul puts it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is now a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Christ. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting mankind's sin against us. He has committed to us the same message. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. Therefore, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Don't fake goodness. Be united to Christ. 
the baptistry is ready. Gary's getting baptized in just a second. Scott Hillier was baptized this morning. We got towels. We can pad down your car seat, get you home. It's okay if you get wet in your church clothes. If you're here, I mean, if you're here today, I'm not kidding. If you feel called to unite with Christ through holy baptism, this is for you. And if you've been united to Christ for years, remember that you're not good by nature. But God has embraced you through his son Jesus and has given you a new heart and has begun a work in your life that you wouldn't have done on your own. No more boasting. No more traditions of man. You don't have to post on Facebook. You're free. You don't have to atone for your sins. You don't have to prove yourself before man. Just learn how to hug the one who's hugged you. The good man Jesus. There is only one. And he has hugged you. Hug him back. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for the illumination of Scripture to highlight our natural selves. We pray that you would put to death the desires and the sins of our flesh, of our carnal nature, and you would well up within us the Holy Spirit, that you would think your thoughts into our conscience and we would agree with them and begin to do the things to live the life of holiness. Oh God, we thank you for saving us at our worst and then changing us to improve. We pray, Father, that we would listen to the Bible and no longer be swayed by the world. May your church reflect the good man, Jesus Christ, and not celebrate ourselves. May you bless the waters of baptism. We pray a blessing for Gary as he gives his body, his soul, his mind consecrated to you. May all who have been baptized do the same as we prepare to sing this great hymn, Take My Life. We bless your name, Father. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. Would you please rise as we sing?
in Jesus. We have reason to celebrate, friends. This is Gary Joy, and he's come forward into the sacred waters of baptism. What has happened to us sinners in the gospel is unfathomably complicated and and critical, and it takes a miracle of God underneath all the work of Jesus, calling out to a heart, giving us a desiring spirit, putting a new heart within us, washing us with the blood of his holy cross. Then he gives us something easy to do. As strange as fiction, come into some water in faith, he says, and be submerged and brought back up to show to the world what he has done. God has also proven that holy baptism, people who willingly in faith enter the waters of baptism, unlock and open a door so that where they've come so far is only the beginning. Jesus kicks open the hinges and much more is to occur. Not only through this baptism, but through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And today we celebrate with Gary. Gary, I have a few questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is alone the good man? Do Do you believe that he has reached for you? Are you hugging him back? Definitely. Praise God. Do you have anything you'd like to say to the church? Okay. I'm going to ask you the most important question of your life. Gary, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you profess him as both Lord and Savior? Yes. Praise God. Gary, we're going to turn you around, pinch your nose, and then grab your wrist. Hold on. I'll get you in just a minute. We're going to go backward, okay? Upon hearing your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. you. You're welcome. Gary, we offer you this candle to represent the light of the Holy Spirit within every believer who guides us and becomes our conscience. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for the gift of faith, of hope, of love, and for this willingness to obey you in all things. I thank you for Gary who has a desire to grow in his walk with you. I thank you for his family and his wife, that together they're going to take these steps. Lord, we pray for the flame of faith within him, the Holy Spirit, to overwhelmingly invade his thoughts, his dreams, his desires, his ambitions. We pray, God, that Jesus, our Savior and priest, would keep that flame burning bright, and that this man would be another light bearer in this world, walking by faith and not just by sight. Bless him, we pray, along with all the faithful, as we live our days for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Would you please rise? Just a reminder that we do have several more weeks to participate in the the well project. The grant is up to $50,000. Uh, we'll keep tell, uh, last week we had up to 20,000 given by the church, so 20, and then 40, and then whatever you want to do the math from there. But it's going to take, if we are able to do this, we're going to be able to dig 20 new wells when so far as a church we've done 10. So this is exponentially amazing. Would you now join us for our benediction? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance unto you and grant you the peace of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.